right here for the three days because if people have questions, and I'm sure they will, they will benefit from, from dialoguing with you. And next we have Lee Morris. Um, Lee hardly needs any introduction. He's one of those people uh, that everybody knows. Those of you who don't know who he is will never forget him after this talk, I'm sure of that. So Lee, thank you. <laughs> It's really lovely to be here today. I'm sure most of you don't know who I am, but um, hopefully some things will reach you. So I will start by saying I'm not an academic. It's not an apology. Um, I'm a <laughs> practitioner. And I've been a practitioner in horticulture, horticultural colleges, botanic gardens, uh, basically the Royal Botanic Garden enemy for 10 years, but, but working in many botanic gardens. And until about seven weeks ago, when I suddenly moved across the city of Edinburgh and now work for the Royal Zoological Society of Scotland based at Edinburgh Zoo. So it's wonderful for me when Katia asked me to come and speak, I said, oh, but Katia, I've just taken a role in, in the Zoological Society. And she went, perfect, that'd be really good because then you can bring both hats. So it's quite nice. So I, I'm going to today give you a little bit about my experience and thoughts working in the botanic garden world and also a few ideas that I've already picked up in my only seven weeks working in the, in the zoo and aquaria world. There are, some, there are some, some good things to learn. So I'm going to start off with sustainability. I, I, I feel that we're all on the same page. None of us have actually gathered together and discussed what we were going to say. So hopefully without being too repetitive, we are all on the same page. So a botanic garden is a very varied thing. It can be two people who happen to set a garden up in Ubud, in Bali, or it might be a very, very large garden with 500 people with 150 taxonomists and a huge herbarium, and, and they're all botanical gardens. So it's a very varied thing, but for all of them, they, they want to be sustainable. And I also believe that all botanic gardens want to do conservation, education, and research. They want to do it, they aspire to do it. How much can they do? Where does that balance fall? And if I had longer, I could give many examples of gardens that I feel are very focused on, on attracting visitors and money because that's just what they have to do. And other gardens, that there are some wealthier gardens in the world, beautifully, that can, that can do more great conservation, education and research. Um, and it's good to know that. So a little bit about the world I was in for 10 years. So the Royal Botanic Garden Edinburgh, fantastic place. People say, why did you leave? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, it was a wonderful place, I had a fantastic time and we did some really great stuff and, and they do. So in terms of formal education, everything from primary school or nursery school right through up to postgraduate studies, um, flagship programmes with the University of Edinburgh, Masters in Biodiversity and Taxonomy of Plants, another flagship course with the University of Glasgow and the Scottish Rural College, HND, BSc, Horticulture and Plantsmanship and a load of RBG branded programmes, certificates and diplomas. So they do lots of formal education, it's great. Um, we do lots of capacity building work, and, and this was something I was particularly keen on and, and, and worked along in, in, when I was there, and through myself and other colleagues, we've done some pretty cool stuff in building capacity around the world. But what's the impact on that? I don't know, how do we measure the impact of what we're doing? You know, is it the right that we go and parachute in and deliver a course? Well, there's multiple ways to do that. Sometimes we bring people to us, we might, pick out individuals, we might do a lot of ways. I believe it's really good stuff, but how good is it? And then of course we come on to interpretation. And interpretation is an interesting word. In, in a lot of places, not just gardens, interpretation, if you're the interpretation officer at, at, a, at a zoo wherever, not the one in Edinburgh, but if you're on it, then maybe your primary focus is panels or signs. But what is interpretation? Personally, I quite like the word communication, and, and it's certainly more than panels and signs, and it's all very much about public engagement. Um, I'm not going to go through the ones on there. The, the two on the pictures on the right, I'll just draw attention to. To the top right picture there is the Eden Project, who I think do some great stuff. And there, that's a visitor, just instantly a little bit of snapshot survey on that visitor. Now, they're, they're trying to get some feedback on the public engagement that that person has had, has had from the visiting of their site. How does that link in? Maybe some of you guys that do social scientists can help us do that better. And the bottom right-hand corner is a, is a great picture because two of my new colleagues are, are the flankers, um, Elena and Helen either side, but the three ladies in the middle 
are master's students in science communication at the University of Edinburgh. So the University of Edinburgh, one of the world's top ten universities, running a master's programme in science communication. They have a module on social media. Imagine. A module on social media. Doesn't that tell you something about the way the world is changing? That a top flight university, science communication, module on social media. So we've got three of those students with us doing an internship now. And we hope to build that onto more, and hopefully there'll be dissertations and PhD projects coming out of that for years to come. Uh, behaviour change. Okay. There's a reason it's a blank slide. So I've been quite keen on this concept of behaviour change for probably the penny dropped for me maybe only three or four years ago. When I said, yeah, we need to change behaviour. Um, and in those sort of dialogues I've had in the Botanic Garden world, and, and not just at Edinburgh, but in the Botanic Garden world per se, I didn't really find a strong, yes, we need to do that. In fact, I've had conversations where people go, you can't say that. <laughs> now, clearly, we shouldn't put it above the gate. We're going to change your behaviour. <laughs> but I have to say, I believe that we should. Now, what was quite refreshing um, is that I've now entered the world of zoos and aquarium. And I would encourage you all to get this, if you can get over the copy. Um, you're welcome to borrow mine while it's here. So, this is the latest edition of the... World Waza, there's Waza, the Azra, and the Azra. I've learned all these new Azes. Um, this is the World Association of Zoo and Aquaria, and this is their journal magazine. It just happens that the current edition is all about effective environmental education. But what's fantastic is in Waza's conservation strategy, top line stuff, and they want to influence people's behaviour and values, and education is seen as an important conservation activity. Fantastic. So I, I celebrate the fact that I've now landed in a culture that champions that and that is really aspiring to change people's behaviour. But the impact of what we do in doing that is difficult to measure. Again, I, I, I challenge you social scientists to help us do that. People have said to me, well, you, you know, you can't really talk about changing people's behaviour because it's very long term, it's difficult to measure. Well, I'm not an academic, so I can say, well, so what? Does that mean we shouldn't do it? <laughs> Does that mean that we should only put KPIs in that are easy to measure over a five-year strategic plan? I don't believe so. And I think if we're not a bit bolder in this, <coughs> you guys don't help us do it, then natural science museums are not going to be able to have the impact on changing people's behaviour and conservation. We need to listen to what David was saying. You know, if we're saying the same message for years, then maybe we need to change. So who's best to change that? Botanists, horticulturists? or social scientists. Um, we need to get people to care. I love the Monterey one that was put up. Um, this was just straight out of my head. I'm sorry that they all started with really. I started writing them all down and they all started with an E. So I found one that came with the last one. But actually the last one's probably the best. I'm told that I can be quite enthusiastic. I'll probably come to a crescendo in the next 20 minutes. <laughs> but you know, it should be enthusiastic. If we can't make it fun and exciting for people, then they won't join in. And, and the last one there, the, the, the image at the bottom, again, is another Eden Project one. That's in their shops. So they're even trying to, to, to motivate people to spend money wisely in their shops. But again, it's impact on how we do it. So, I've now moved to a zoo world. Look very carefully at the, at the faces of those children. Hands up who's ever seen that level of excitement looking at a plant. <laughs> Again, David, we've obviously collaborated on our presentations, we haven't, we clearly have. But you don't get that with plants. And that's one of the things that inspired me to leave that wonderful place, the Royal Botanic Garden Edinburgh, and, and move across the city to where we get lots of faces like that. Now, the closest I've seen to that, and again, is that. <laughs> <laughs> so the closest I've seen to, to young people getting really excited and enthused about plants, and, and, and that, please don't get me wrong, people are enthused about plants, but you know exactly what I mean, we mentioned it a few times, you know, you see, a, you see a panda, wow, now I'm now in a place where we have pandas, so I know all about, I'm learning all about the intricacies of whether a panda's pregnant or not. <laughs> so, I get pandas, but this was a great quote, so, this was a presentation at APGA, American Public Gardens Association, about three years ago, um, and a lady called Pat Matheson stood up and, and she did a presentation called Carrots, the Pandas of Botanic Gardens. And I've, I've said this for a couple of years, I've quoted it. I get it even more now because I'm now in a place with pandas. But it's true. Growing vegetables, sowing seeds, seeing things grow, eating things does excite people. So I'm not suggesting that we turn all botanic gardens into allotments, far from it, but you, through the BGCI initiative, growing communities, 
gardeners are starting to do this, and we're already hearing about that. So, um, parrots, the pandas of botanic gardens. Um, we do need to inspire action. We want people to do something after they've visited. And again, social scientists, you need to tell us how to do that, or whether they are doing that. There was, there was a, uh, I'm not going to keep holding up the magazine from Waza, but there's a very interesting article in there of a project that was done in Zoos and Aquarium in the US, again, Monterey Bay were involved, about how they looked at this in terms of people visiting, and they, they took a pilot study group, and they, they assessed them on the day of visit, they assessed them X, years, X months later, and then X years later, and just tried to get some data in terms of how they were changing their behaviour or habits in response to a visit. Um, so we need to inspire action, be it, be it via blitzes, going on earth <coughs> projects, volunteering on beach cleans, or even, well not even, but just becoming members of your garden, of your zoo, of your aquarium, actually joining it and feeling that by doing that, they are contributing to conservation. We need to go beyond the walls. I could have put many examples of that. I've just put a few examples of The one I'm going to draw your attention to is, is one from my new institution on the bottom right corner. It's very cool. I now work with a team of people who have a bus. So, it had nothing to do with getting the bus, but we now have a bus that travels around Scotland, funded jointly with Clydesdale Bank, and, and we go around delivering biodiversity conservation classes in schools um, all around Scotland. Very cool stuff, but we're teaching plants as well. So the plants are in there because it's biodiversity. The internet. We could talk lots again, social media, etc. Well, actually, while we're on the subject of social media, I'm going to do my little champion to try and inspire you guys to, to help with this. I, I don't know about social media. Some people think I'm a Twitter geek. I'm not, but again, I went to APGA, and by the time the fifth person stood up and said, put your phone on silent and send a tweet out about me, and we've got 60,000 followers on Facebook, and it's our best marketing. I was sitting there as a senior member of a large botanic garden responsible for communication and education that didn't do this, and I felt quite inept. So for the last three years, I've actually jumped in, because I'm kinesthetic, and I need to jump in and engage. But, you know, I think we can do it better. But I do believe that there is, a, there is some connection there. You know, getting people to have conversations about conservation, the potential for social media to do that in, in all its forms and through the web it, is, is bigger than we're currently doing, I, I'm certain. So, to help with that, hashtag conservation leaders. For those of you that have Twitter accounts, just do something. Join that conversation about this conference and let's start to stimulate that. So, hashtag conservation leaders. I shall look forward to engaging with you. Um, the last two there are examples from Edinburgh. So, virtual learning environment, uh, and the one on the bottom right hand corner is something that was set up as a, on the website called Botanic Stories, where it links blogs, Twitter feeds, Facebook feeds of all what our taxonomists and horticulturists, um, sorry, not ours, there, taxonomists and horticulturists are doing in terms of conservation, horticultural research, etc. I'm not saying that they're perfect, but they're attempts to try and connect to people. And, and I think the internet has got more potential. But this was interesting. Now, having sat in plant collection meetings at Edinburgh, in Oman, in Laos, in a number of projects I've been involved with for the last 10 years, I've suddenly landed in a place that has, in my view, an extremely critical and objective scoring system before any animal finds its way into Edinburgh Zoo or the Highland Wildlife Park. So that's not the whole list on the right, but first of all, you have to say on the suitability, is the space, is the budget, are they available? But what's most interesting is on the right side where you start talking about visitor appeal, conservation issues, educational value, are there some purpose in research, what is their conservation status? Now, I don't want to get into the debating of the, of the whole zoo issue, but the fact that these criteria are used before, to select their living collections, I would say now, from what I've seen there, that botanic gardens could be a bit more strategic, per se, in selecting the plants that they put in their living collections. And there's potential maybe for botanic gardens to evolve in that way and, and, and focus, what is that? Why do we have that plan? What is the purpose? Research needs. Absolutely, botanic gardens need to continue doing baseline data, taxonomic surveys, um, traditional taxonomy and now more genetic work. Absolutely, that, that is important work and it links in. But what else should they do? 
you know, science, and it's, it's not just in Edinburgh, but many botanic gardens will have a horticulture division and a science division. And as a horticultural scientist, I used to say, we do science. And horticulturists do. And so maybe botanic gardens need to evolve their science and start doing some niche areas of horticulture that feed into that. Social science I've already talked about, massive potential. That's why the vision of Katia to have this conference. So I don't need to talk about that. What I will say, feeding on to that, very nice. I don't spend all my life going to conferences, but I did go to the Global Horticultural Congress in August. Um, approaching 3,000 delegates. I don't think I'd have needed more than my fingers and thumbs to count the number of people from botanic gardens that were at the Global Horticultural Congress. Massive potential, and the number of presentations I sat in where I kept putting my hand up and said, have you linked with botanic gardens on this? Lots of potential. Some we do already, and I, I believe there's potential to do more of that. Everything, you know, wild caught relatives, aerial surveying, even their education group. There's ways that I believe we can link in. And health and well-being. Again, we've touched on that already today, but it's very, very political, especially in Scotland, where the health, you know, Scottish health is not good, especially if you get towards the West Coast. The average lifespan is not high in Scotland. There's huge obesity problems. We know the issues, okay? So what can Botanic Gardens do with that? Well, already through various initiatives, edible gardening, etc., they're doing that. Could there be more? Um, what was interesting recently in the, in the press in the, in the UK, um, the, the article on the right, one of the Lord Darcy came out saying that London parks should ban smoking. Um, maybe they should, maybe Botanic Gardens should. Would that stop visitors coming or would that be a statement about health? I'm not saying we should do all the other, but I, I do believe we should think about it. What, what are we actually saying within our boundaries about what we care about in terms of public health? Should we be leading that? Should we be afraid to say, we're going to champion that, draw that line, and this is what we're doing for, for public health? I went to visit the natural you know, the Scottish Museum on Saturday, last Saturday, in preparation for coming out, but I've been many times, fantastic, but I went with very objective eyes, thinking, right, let's go and look at purely the, the natural history section and, and appraise them. Now, again I'm quoting another colleague, call to action. There wasn't really a call to action. Now I did speak to the, one of the team that helped design this and that wasn't in their strategy. If you go to the top level gallery, ha, sorry, you're, I'm, you're very passive, I'm normally interactive. Hands up if you've been to the National Museum of Scotland. Yes, some have, yeah, there's a few. Okay, so it's about the natural history, but should there be more of a call to action? Well, when you get to the top gallery, there is a bit more. What was most impressive, I'm not saying this is particularly good interpretation, it's not bad, but down here, you can't read that, but that says William Milligan Royal Botanic Gardens Q. So the point from that is that there's a botanic garden scientist who's inputted into interpretive material within a natural sciences museum. Maybe there should be more of that. I don't know how much of that there is. I've never researched it. I need some researchers to do that. So, maximising our impact. Reprioritisation? Well, I think we should challenge ourselves. I really do. Um, and, and, and please, this is, this, is not a, this is not a view on, on Edinburgh Botanic Garden. Absolutely not. This is, I've, I've come in contact with many Botanic Gardens. I've been to many BTCI Congresses, spoke to many, many people. So this is a generic view of Botanic Gardens. I think we should seriously look down and say, right, it's the 21st century. I, I read something by someone, I can't remember who it was. They talk about the, the days when Botanic Gardens were set up. We gather plants, we put them in a garden, put a fence around. We'll have a zoo, we gather animals, we put them in cages, put a fence around. We'll have an aquarium, we gather... So the animals put glass around them. Well, should we not merge them a bit more? Should we not merge them a bit more? What, what is the way, you know, ecosystems? Is, is that not the way it should be? Now I see that happening, and there are, there are examples. David's mentioned some, Sarah's mentioned some. There are, there are examples that we're doing that. Is that pace enough? Or should we be bolder in actually trying to link that to then get the messages that people care about? But again, we need to be linking with you guys to find out what the right messages are to get people to connect, to get that emotive connection so that they do get inspired to go and become a member or do something when they've left. And um, partnerships and collaborations, it's easy, everyone will stand on a stage and say we need to partner or collaborate, but we do. And seven weeks in, if I flip back into the botanic garden world, I promise you, not just the examples I've put up now, but just 
seeing some of the things that I've contacted already, I know I'd do my job better if I went back to it now. So if I can think that, then surely if we can get more people from those organisations around the same table, there can be a little bit of mutual sharing. And I think if we do that, then this whole ecosystem approach might suddenly blossom. So to try and champion that, in, in the UK, I, I do believe in synchronicity. Synchronicity is a great thing. There's something called the Botanic Garden Education Network. And this isn't just for botanic gardens, but it's, it's, for, it's for gardens or environmental organisations in the UK that, that do education. Predominantly schools-based, but, but broader. Um, this year, ah, it's at Paynton Zoo, imagine. So there aren't many zoos that are members, but Paynton Zoo near Bristol is. So for the first time, the Royal Zoological Society of Scotland are taking some of our education team and we're going to the BGEN conference at Paynton Zoo. And, and my plan is to chuck them all in the same room, per se, like they're watching this after the fact, um, and get them to bond. Because by the time they've had those conversations, maybe the concept of how we do bioblitzes at the zoo where we, we've got botanical keys, maybe the people from the botanic garden can help us do that bit better. And likewise, when the botanic garden are doing bioblitzes and they're looking at bugs and mammals and birds, maybe we need to link to do that better. So that will be interesting. So absolutely collaborations. Um, I do think we need to link stronger to commercial hall. My background initially was crop production. So my undergraduate was in crop production marketing. My master's was in international horticultural crop production. So that was my bag before I then went into botanic gardens and education. So I understand commercial hall. I can have a conversation with people and say, yeah, yeah, we could help you with that. And I believe we can. So I think botanic gardens are some great examples and, and, and maybe more. Health and well-being, the political agenda. Now what strength that can give us in other dealings who knows? But again, I question whether we should be we should be bolder. And certainly, I'm not apologising ever again for talking about changing people's behaviour. But I promise never to put it on a leaflet that welcomes people to a zoo or a garden saying, welcome, we're going to change your behaviour today. <laughs> um, and I think we should focus our research on potentially new priorities. This was great. I didn't know about this when I put my presentation together. So this was 11th of September, and that's Sarah up there on the left. So uh, fantastic. So I've talked about all this, and I, I suddenly found this, and I thought, blimey, they beat me to it. But actually, no, this shows that we're going the right way. So this shows that Botanic Garden Conservation International, the European Association of Zoos and Aquarius, and Excite, which is the European network of science centres and museums, have already signed a memorandum of agreement to work together on doing this sort of stuff. Fantastic. So that's the first, or maybe, I don't, probably isn't the first, but it's certainly a significant step in doing what I think we all want to do. So that's wonderful. Um, global challenges, if we don't leave in tackling them, who will? Is my, I guess, my end of message. There's three and a half thousand botanic gardens. I've tried to Google to get a figure on zoos, 5,000 plus. I don't know how many millions of combined visitors we all get per year, but the potential impact we could get if we, if we collaborate, get our stories correct, get our delivery mechanisms correct, measure the effectiveness, it's got to be more than we're doing now. Surely we, we, can, we can do more. It's very, very exciting, the, the possibilities. Um, thank you for listening, and please, hashtag conservation leaders and stimulate this to grow. Thank you. Hashtag announcement, which Marion had asked me to do, and, and I failed. So thank you. Um, the issue of uh, zoos, natural science museums, and botanic gardens having uh, conversations is something that Esther uh, has been involved in, and there's a possibility, right, Esther, of uh, scholarly.